one sir please start uh, good evening friends uh, welcome to the thursday evening webinar series of the uh, delhi csi the unique pg track program and we are into the 38th webinar today and it's been a great journey i've got many mails and messages today that uh, this particular sessions if they want to view yes they are available on the youtube channel pg track csi delhi branch you can view all the sessions if you have any questions comments or clarifications please write to us on over the same email and we will be very happy to answer all your questions and clarifications so today we are coming with a very interesting topic very exam focused topic very practical topic that every resident looks up to because this comes either as a short case or a long case and everybody has to pass through this and this is a continuous murmur so continuous murmur how do we approach and how are we uh, going to deal with this continuous murmurs so that is one of the major challenges that we face in exam and today uh, we have the privilege of having uh, uh, dr balachander you know he is one of the finest teachers uh, of our uh, of uh, the present times and uh, sir has been uh, dean of the uh, jipmer uh, uh, and to, uh, now uh, sir has joined us again for the second session and along with me on this journey i have professor sumod korean who is professor of cardiology at jb pant hospital i have uh, professor girish mp who is again professor of cardiology at jb pant hospital and my colleague dr safal who is associate professor of cardiology at jb pant hospital and full hearted welcome to all of you who are waiting to listen to dr balachander so i would request dr sumod to please uh, uh, welcome uh, sir um it's a really a pleasure and uh, let us uh, listen to this wonderful session yeah good evening and a very warm welcome once again for this uh, pg track program uh, as we all know continuous murmurs are a common uh, critical case and uh, how to you know differentiate the various causes of uh, continuous murmur is a very commonly asked question and even if you are making a, a diagnosis of rsov you know where exactly the rupture is occurring again is a very uh, you know uh, sometimes could be very difficult to uh, 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 diagnose so uh, to explain all that we have professor uh, j uh, balchandra sir sir is one of the most sought after examiners uh, uh, in uh, both, both in dnb as well as in uh, dm cardiology and uh, sir has a huge experience and uh, uh, and it is our great privilege to hear from sir uh, how to how to uh, differentiate the causes and also how to uh, you know interpret what is the site and and all the other nuances of uh, this uh, particular case uh, as mohit has already experienced sir has been uh, associated with jibba for a very long time uh, as the hod there subsequently dean and now sir is uh, uh, in the private sector and we welcome sir please come and uh, deliver this lecture uh, can you uh, good evening uh, girish girish has joined so good evening girish so good evening sir uh, good evening sir Can we start? Uh, am I yes, audible? sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Yes. Okay. So, thank you so much once again for calling me. Uh, last time they said we will call you again. I said familiarity will breed contempt. <laughs> so I said no, no. So that's why such a long gap. So it doesn't matter at all for us. So continuous murmurs and uh, with special focus on RSOV. Although I will touch little about the other continuous murmurs also, but uh, it's a very important thing. Just like you know, from undergraduate dates. Uh, these continuous murmurs will bug all the students so even undergraduate exam they'll say list the continuous murmurs postgraduate md they'll say list the continuous murmurs dm and dnb they'll say list the continuous murmurs but you will have to change your way of presentation according to your uh, style next slide so continuous what are continuous murmurs they are defined as a murmur this definition they will ask at the beginning of any continuous murmur uh, uh, case so this is a murmur as which begins in systole and continues uninterrupted through the second heart sound to all or part of diastole this is very important to stress the word all or part of diastole because continuous murmurs will not occupy the whole thing so when the continuous murmur will cross from systole to diastole it should meet some criteria and what are the criteria one there is no change in the character of the murmur from uh, uh, systole to diastole it it remains almost the same although there may be minor changes we'll come to that the second heart sound or the components are enveloped or masked by the murmur and this will not follow the boundary of systole and diastole so it should not break more important and sometimes they will ask is is it hollow systolic and hollow diastolic or it is just a continuous murmur now the murmurs may not occupy the hollow systolic it may start little later in systole 
it will not occupy the whole diastole. So it is not a holosystolic and a holodiastolic murmur. They will start in systole and they will go on to the part or uh, hole of diastole. Next time. So these some terminologies are the same. It will go uninterrupted through the S2. They may peak in S2. They may not peak in S2, but they will go un uninterrupted. Now, sometimes a murmur, uh, immediately the next question is, what is a to and fro murmur? Now, this differentiation I will explain in detail a little later on. But to and fro murmur is the systolic component, blood flowing in one direction, and diastolic murmur flowing in the other direction. For example, in uh, ejection systolic murmur of AS and the early diastolic murmur of AR or PS and PR. But the continuous murmur is blood flows in the same direction uh, in systole and diastole. Now, similarly, DSD AR also is referred to as a to and fro murmur, but this it comes under a different classification. It's called as a systole diastolic murmur because it doesn't go through the same orifice. So we'll see these differences as we go ahead. Next time. Next slide, please. So there are situations where continuous murmurs are expected to occur. And what are those situations? When there is a communication between a high pressure vessel and a low pressure vessel or a chamber so that persistent pressure gradient is present throughout systole and diastole. Here I will digress a bit and they will ask, how does a peripheral pulmonic stenosis present a continuous murmur? Now the peripheral pulmonic stenosis is only a stenosis of the pulmonary artery. It should produce only systolic murmur. But occasionally it can produce a continuous murmur simply because it forms what is known as a back pipe effect. All of you must be knowing what is a back pipe. It is uh, there in the Republic Day Parade. So the back pipe is nothing but the person blows, fills up his bag, and then has a continuous uh, pressure by his arm, which will give the uh, flow. So that is how the first systole will uh, inflate the dilate, dilated proximal chamber and a continuous pressure gradient is built up. So that's an important thing to remember in uh, peripheral pulmonic stenosis, what is known as a back pipe effect. If there is a marked increase in velocity of blood, which results in turbulence, then also you will get a continuous murmur. And of course, when there's a localized constriction. So the immediately when you have a continuous murmur, you know that the distal segment is in a low pressure gradient. Next slide. Next one. So there are some continuous murmurs which are not due to regurgitation. It can be caused by, as I said, peripheral pulmonic stenosis. It can be caused by portal vein obst uh, obstruction which is heard in the epigastrium. Now people keep on talking about extra hepatic portal vein obstruction. They start showing slides of Abernathy malformation, type 1, type 2, and all that in quiz programs. So that is extra hepatic portal vein obstruction, which can give rise. But usually continuous permits don't occur in that situation. You also hear sometimes what is known as Kruvilar Baumgartner syndrome, where there is, you know, you have a, a prominence of the umbilical veins, there you can have a continuous murmur. So all these hepatopulmonary syndromes, they can have conti uh, occasionally continuous murmurs, but that's largely due to the pulmonary uh, rather than to the hepatic problems. You can get, of course, torrential venous flow. Uh, in fact, arterial venous fistula, uh, commonest, will be the cause of continuous murmur because you'll find that every other patient who comes for cardiac cath will be having CKV and will be on dialysis with a fistula. So that may be one of the commonest now as uh, a large arterial venous fistula. So TAPVC is important and venous sum is also uh, rarely heard. There are some continuous murmurs which are transmitted from the chest to the neck and that is the venous hum, an arterial venous fistula, a partial subclavian artery occlusion occasionally in uh, Takayasu arthritis. Now continuous murmurs involve the thoracic aorta, that is PDA or a coarctation or a mammary suffle. Aortopulmonary septal defect is a rare cause of uh, continuous murmur. Usually it causes only systolic murmurs. And of course, we have rare conditions like internal memory to uh, pulmonary vein fistula or RSOV, which we shall see. Next one. The mechanism, as I've already said, I won't go back again to the mechanism. It depends upon the continuous significant gradient. And these continuous murmurs are produced due to a large communication within a high pressure and low pressure system. Next slide. Now, in the exam, when the student is asked to uh, uh, list the continuous murmurs, you will just list in undergraduate, you know, PDA, et cetera. In PG, you will just say, again, the same thing, maybe you'll add. But in DM or DNP level, you'll have to classify. And if you classify, 
you may not forget everything. Of course, you may not be able to achieve 100% of what you have read in the exam, uh, but you will be able to classify means the examiner gets impressed. So the first classification is an abdominal communication between systemic and pulmonary arteries. So that's easy to remember, systemic and pulmonary arteries, abdominal communication like PDA, AP window, or a truncus, or a alcapa, or a bronchial collateral with the TOF, with the pulmonary atresia. And of course, you have the surgical shunts, which are BT or Waterston or pot shunts, which uh, again uh, are uh, the between systemic and pulmonary arteries. Next slide. Then you have abdominal communications between systemic to the right side of the heart, and which is RSOV and coronary cameral fistula. And then you have critical narrowing of an artery, which is due to turbulent flow, like proximal coronary stenosis, coaptation, and peripheral pulmonic stenosis. Or there's a change in the venous flow, which gives rise to a venous hum, or a TAPVC, or a porto systemic shunts, which are there. Next slide. Then you have arterial venous fistula, which I already said, could be post-traumatic, febrile artery is very rare now, and uh, hemodialysis. You have excessive flow through an area which is due to physiological or pathological changes like mammary suffol in pregnancy. You have newton basher syndrome where there is MS with a restrictive AST, occasionally in hemangioma, and largely you have in hyperemia of the neoplasm like hepatoma, etc. Next slide. So these are, if you classify like this and present, even if you miss 50%, uh, it gives a good, uh, good uh, impression to the examiner. So this is a classification which you can keep in mind. To see the intracardiac causes, of course, you know that coronary artery to right heart or as Newton-Bosch's syndrome, occasionally caught right atrium can give rise to a continuous murmur high in the left axilla. But the most common cause of a continuous murmur is still the PDA. Next slide. I'll go through the uh, slides of PDA very rapidly because, uh, next slide please. So when uh, PDA will not touch much, but let us now talk about two and fro murmurs, which means the flow which is in one direction and the uh, another direction. So actually they are not really continuous murmurs. You should not put them as continuous murmurs, but because some questions are asked, we will just need what is uh, a two and fro murmurs. The important of this is that the murmurs of stenosis are rough, they are PDM pitched and diamond shaped, and they taper towards the end of systole, which will not occur in a continuous murmur, ending before A2 or P2, depending on the site. But the diastolic murmur becomes starts high pitched or sometimes low pitched if there is a PR murmur. And it, it's so totally different pitches, totally different timing of starting and time of ending. The S2 is well audible in two and fro murmurs. Next slide. And this is what is called as a systolo-diastolic murmur or a combined systolic and diastolic murmurs. They are not due to flow through the same orifice. And for example, the classical is VSDAR, which comes in close differential diagnosis with an RSOV. There is a gap which heard between the two murmurs and the second heart sound and its components are well heard and the peaking will not occur around the second heart sound. Next slide. So this diagram I've taken from, uh, see, the Essentials of Postgraduate uh, Cardiology is a very good book. And this chapter of continuous murmur is written by Dr. Ranjit Nath from RML. So some one or two diagrams I've taken from them. It's very nice, uh, shown the continuous murmur of PDA, the to and fro murmur, which occurs in AS and AR, and of course, the systole-diastolic murmur, which is seen in VSTAR. And the next uh, table, uh, next slide, also shows the a difference between continuous murmur, a to and fro murmur, and a systolo-diastolic murmur. And this we have to read just before the exam so that you will be able to uh, tell us that the unidirectional single murmur is a continuous murmur, whereas it's a systolic in one direction and diastolic in the other. And what are the representatives? PDA for continuous, ASAR for to and fro, and VSTR for systolo-diastolic. The S2 is masked, the S2 is separate in all the others. The peaking is one peak for the continuous murmur, whereas separate peaks for the other two. And the source of murmur is extra cardiac, whereas the other two are invariably intracardiac. And the gap is at the S2 is absent. So this is an important uh, slide, which will uh, tell you the difference between the three types, which are usually uh, present. Now, this is the most important slide as far as I'm concerned, because the when the uh, 
candidate is presenting, he should present in such a way that no questions are asked about the murmur. He should not just say continuous murmur, present in the second left intercostal space, that's all, leave it. If you say that, then we are not coming to a diagnosis at all. So what are the points to remember while describing a continuous murmur? This is repeatedly taught in all the uh, centers, I know that, but uh, we have to revise it again before the exam. One is, the murmur is truly continuous or not? What is the grade of the murmur? Continuous murmurs can be graded. Quality, pitch, or frequency of the murmur? What starts and what end the murmur? Is there a gap between S1 and the onset of murmur and the length in diastole? What is the peak of the murmur? Does it peak around S2? Is there a systolic augmentation or a diastolic augmentation? Are there eddy sounds or click or S3? And most and most important is where is it heard best and what is next best? These are the two points you have to keep in mind. Best, second left intercostal space, next best where it is and what is its radiation and propagation. You just see with regard to PDA, next slide. So it will uh, fit in all that. It's a classical continuous murmur and due to persistence of flow from the pulmonary artery to the PDA. So it is of mixed frequency and it is harsh and it is crescent due to S2. It peaks just after the S2. It tapers off uh, during late diastole. There, there it becomes decreased to. Now the PDA uh, position is very important. It may be associated with a thrill best heard in the second left intercostal space and next best heard just below the clavicle. This will not occur in uh, more important to that, we'll come to that, is the systolic component can radiate widely, but the diastolic component is relegated to the second left intercostal space. So that also we'll have to keep in mind when you diagnose PDA. Once you present it like this, they ask, what's the differential diagnosis? No differential diagnosis. This is PDA, nothing else. So, but if it is not, we'll have to think of other conditions. Next slide. PDA, of course, is uh, not kept in the exam except when there is severe pulmonary artery hypertension and there is some sort of a Eisenberger-like syndrome because it's purely uh, postgraduate. Next slide. I'll just tell you, I won't take much time on PDA because uh, uh, there are features uh, that you can get a systolic murmur. This is only for practice that you can get a PDA with a systolic murmur and uh, as you are catheterizing, you will suddenly enter the PDA, especially in newborns. Next slide. So the characteristic of PDA is that there are multiple clicks. And if there's a large flow PDA, then you will have the following things. You have an LV type of FX, you have an LVS3, you have a mid-diastolic murmur across the mitral valve, a single or a paradoxically split S2 and a high volume pulse. And once you have Eisenmenger, the murmur may disappear or there may be a differential cyanosis. Next slide. When you come to the uh, uh, PDA murmur, as I said, it is loudest at the second left intercostal space, next loudest at the first left intercostal space. What happens if there is a right side idiotic arch? It may be heard on the right side. So if the cause of the continuous murmur is not a PDA, the murmur will be in the left, second left intercostal spa, uh, space, but next loudest in the third left intercostal space. So it can disappear occasionally. And the most important differential diagnosis here would be a small VST with a AR. Next slide. The other auscultatory signs are there. Uh, these are all, you know, uh, dynamic auscultations, which we hardly do for PDA, amyl nitrate, we don't use, we don't use vasopressors, but occasionally the paradoxically split S2, et cetera, can cause, and you can have an opening snap across, but these are very, very rare. So we don't have to remember this, but important thing is the adhesomes, which are heard. And these adhesomes have been theorized to be a head-on collision of streaming across the ductus or PA. And it is usually heard in the low flow ducti and may be present in the diastolic comp. So this is an important thing to identify eddy sounds which are there in the second half of systole. They will not occur with clicks. Clicks will come in the first half. Eddy sounds will come in the second half because the uh, two streams have to have a head-on collision. Next slide. So when there is a high pulmonary artery pressure, this is the type of PDA which is kept in the exam, PDA with Eisenberger. You have to have the differential cyanosis and clubbing. 
which can be brought about with exercise. You can carefully exercise the patient and try to bring out the differential cyanosis in the legs as compared to the arm. So the legs are clubbed and cyanosis. The important thing here is that please measure if you are using a pulse oximeter or if you are allowed to use a pulse oximeter, you measure with two pulse oximeters, one in the right hand and the other in the leg. Then reverse the pulse oximeters to eliminate the technical errors. This is a simple technique because sometimes the pulse oximeters, you know, will show something different. So in order to uh, sort of reverse, uh, we show the technical error is abolished. You can reverse and show. And of course, if the legs and the left hand are cyanose, the left sub subclavian artery is juxtaductal. And if the right hand is also cyanose, the right subclavian artery is arising as a last branch apparently below the ductus. Now, sometimes ductus can have uniform clubbing and cyanosis, and they will ask what are the causes if there is uniform clubbing and cyanosis in PDA Eisenmenger. The causes are one, Eisenmenger PDA with lung disease, multiple arteriovenous connections in the submucosa in the lung, consequent to plexiform arteriopathy, and of course, the right uh, atrial pressure increases, and there is a right to left shunt through the PFO. So these are the causes where you get uniform clubbing and cyanosis in a case of uh, Eisenmenger type of PDA. Okay, <clears throat> next slide. Next slide. So now we come to the uh, rupture sinus balsam. We'll come to the differential diagnosis when we talk about rupture sinus. It can be congenital, it can be, of course, traumatic or endocarditis. The major site of origin is, of course, the RCC and uh, the right coronary cusp in about 75%. And the non coronary cusp is about 18%. The site of rupture is, of course, into the RV in about 60% and RA in 25%. Now, in continuous murmur, if the, the straight away you can get a diagnosis, if you put your hand on the patient and if you get a superficial thrill and a classical one, just like purring of cat, it comes, you are sure that it is going into the RA because this is the one RA is a superficial structure. So you will get the murmur, uh, which is truly continuous with a loud systolic component and a jet of blood coming from posterior to aorta to anterior uh, RA. So that's how it comes. So you get a very superficial thrill as if you are just auscultating over the rupture site and you get a purring, purring sensation. It is also heard in the left lower sternal border and the left uh, right sternal border over the zygoid process. And this I will... Uh, show again with the help of a diagram. When you come to RV rupture, the diastolic component of the murmur is more pronounced and the systolic component can be reduced. Why? Because the right ventricular systolic pressures can be elevated due to pH. There can be a narrowing of the tract due to the contraction of the right ventricle in systole. There can be a venturi effect of the left ventricle to aortic forward flow beyond the origin of the fistula and the murmur is best heard in the mid to lower parastyle here. So these are important problem uh, uh, points to note when the RV rupture occurs. And the associated uh, problems like VSD and AR. In fact, uh, rupture sinus of Pulsalva will have a lot of murmurs and uh, we don't know what to make because everything is drowned in the continuous murmur of the uh, rup uh, rupture. Next slide. So this is just a diagram to show you the potential sites. The north coronary cusp ruptures into the uh, RA. The right side also can rupture into the RA and into the RV. And uh, occasionally, you have LA and LV ruptures. Next slide. There are some uh, aneurysms which need not rupture. But and, uh, so supposing they have not yet ruptured or the unruptured aneurysms, they can manifest with the to and fro barbar because it just goes into that aneurysm and comes out. There is a barbar of tricuspid regurgitation. There is a mid systolic barbar of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction because it can obstruct the right ventricular outflow tract. There can be a pain of myocardial ischemia. There can be AR. There can be a superior vena cable obstruction and sometimes very rarely. Always look at this because I have missed this in a patient. This is called Pemberton's sign when the patient lifts his uh, two hands his superior vena cava gets obstructed. This occurs in retrosternal goiter. The same thing happened when the patient was lying down. He had severe uh, congestion of his face. When he got up, he, uh, it subsided because there was a large uh, unruptured sinus aneurysm which was uh, hitting on the superior vena cava. 
at the minute he gets up it moves away from the superior vena cava and there is no rupture so keep in mind these uh, interesting small small findings which can sometimes give you a diagnosis and there's a paracardiac mass in the x-ray they can have systemic emboli they can have complete heart block they can have syncope etc what is the history of uh, rso yeah, this is very important because uh, the history uh, you will have different types of histories in different centers rupture aortic sinus aneurysms plaques usually before age 30 years of course more common in males very rarely in infancy but usually only in young adults and sometimes they go straight into congestive heart failure now remember if the patient gives a sudden history of a tearing sensation just like um, a chest pain and there is overload of all the four chambers so there's only one diagnosis rsov into ra because rsov into ra will overload all the four chambers the ra rb la and lv of course small perforations will come into because of continuous murmur next slide next one so it is uh, uh, there is only a weakness there can be all the complications like retinal emboli angina pectoris and abdominal pain also can occur intractable dyspnea can occur all this are possibilities which occur suddenly so the history is of short duration and that's why uh, uh, interestingly i have taken the three histories from perloff but every cent next slide there are three illustrative examples which are there this is only taken from perloff but all of all your centers will have something or the other for example when i went to bombay and there was an rsov this uh, was a best driver and he said that uh, during the floods he had to push the uh, bus uh, bus got stuck and immediately he had this problem so like that each uh, will have a sudden onset of uh, some strenuous activity preceding the onset of his symptoms next slide this is the first type the second type is the person who just sits in the desk and suddenly he experiences shortness of breath chest pain and epigastric discomfort this also can occur in uh, rsov and the third one is after uh, taking some food and then you have vomiting so all the three uh, scenarios are well illustrated in perloff i have not uh, made up i've just copied what is there in perloff but your own centers will have different types of patients with different types of scenario but what is important is the short history the short history of onset of chest pain followed by dyspnea or congestive heart failure next slide the appearance is uh, important because it rarely occurs before puberty so it is normally developed occasionally associated with uh, some skeletal abnormalities like klippelfield syndrome which has a short neck a low posterior hairline etc etc and you have occasionally with munan syndrome you have marfan syndrome also next slide and those are the things we have to look for in patients so when you are describing look for all the general physical appearance of all these uh, uh, syndromes which are associated with rupture sinus of alsalva the interesting feature is the jugular venous pulse because you have to look at the jvp it will give us some uh, uh, information where it is rupturing now a large uh, sudden rupture into ra or rb is accompanied by congestive heart failure so it will elevate the mean jugular and causes a tall a and b waves so remember that one of the causes of a b wave greater than a wave is a rupture of the sinus of alsalva into the uh, right atrium there are other causes where you have b wave more prominent like all pre tricuspid shunts or sometimes in lv2 ra shunts or coronary artery fistulas uh, uh, coronary cameral fistulas but in rupture sinus of alsalva rupturing into ra the v may become taller than f next one i'm just showing you the different forms of jugular venous pulsations and one interesting aspect which you see is that the c also becomes prominent so you get a c and b triple waves when it ruptures into ra or rb so this is an important sign of course you may be able to see it or not but this is an important sign and sometimes when there is severe tr you will have the v waves which are prominent and when it goes into the rv ot and when it obstructs or the uh, obstructs the rv ot you will get an a wave prominent so a can become prominent 
A, C, D can become prominent and V can become prominent uh, depending upon the site of the rupture. Next slide. The arterial pulse is there, but uh, disparience is not very common, but it just can be uh, felt. Carotid pulses are visible, Quinkies pulses are visible, pistol shot sounds can be heard, Derusius, but, but, but at the, the difference between AR and all this is that you will not get the dilatation of the aorta, which you will be getting in AR. AR, you get suprasternal pulsations and you may get some, a lot of uh, other pulsations, but in ruptures and as well silver, you will not get suprasternal pulsations because simply because the uh, aortic runoff is at the base of the aorta. That is, the aorta is not uh, that much dilated. And sometimes when an aneurysm penetrates uh, the base of the ventricular septum, it will cause a complete heart block and sometimes it will be slow heart rate. Next slide. But this is the uh, pulse waveform, which shows the uh, rapid rise of the brachial uh, artery. Next slide. Now, the precordial movement is also important and the, uh, we don't try to look at because we are sort of the attention goes off towards the continuous murmur, but we must look at the JVP properly. We must look at the first before, before all that, we must look at the general physical appearance, uh, take all the height, you know, the height, uh, arm span, etc. Don't forget all that. Then come to the JVP, then come to the precordial impulses and palpation. So it will depend upon the size, the rapidity, the duration of the rupture and on the recipient changer and whether uh, it uh, ruptures into LV that is very rare. Now when the rupture is into RA or RV, both RA and RV are hyperdynamic because the blood from the rupture circulates in all the four chambers. As I told you that when it ruptures into RA, all four chambers are volume overloaded. So if it ruptures directly into the uh, RA, you will get uh, overload of all the four chambers. And the important thing is that you may get a left parasitum and heave, but this will be heard, felt only in the sub xiphoid area. Next slide. And also look at the thrill. And the important thing is the thrill, the intercostal space where the thrill is most prominent, etc. So that is an important thing for the murmur. And now let us come to auscultation because that's a way you have to describe the murmur. The first heart sound is usually normal. The second heart sound is split with a loud P2. There may be S3 because of biventricular failure, but sometimes a continuous murmur in a healthy individual, you will be able to see, I mean, you'll be able to feel at the second left intercostal space, which is best heard in the mid to lower left sternal border if it ruptures into the body of the RV and along the upper left. So you must see where the continuous murmur is best heard and you must use a technique which is known as inching technique in auscultation, which uh, uh, nowadays we don't stress too much on that because everything we have to cover, echo and all that give you the diagnosis. But see where it is best heard, go from apex to base and base to apex, where the murmur is best heard, where the murmur is next left heard, where it is accentuated in diastole or accentuated in systole. So all this we have to look at it and look whether it is superficial, loud, harsh and a sawing quality, just like, you know, you have absent pulmonary valve syndrome. It's a sawing quality murmur. It immediately tells you that it is RA uh, rupturing into RA. There is no peaking around the second heart sound, unlike the continuous murmur of ductus. So the continuous murmur is absent in very rarely when LV, where that will behave like aortic regurgitation. But otherwise, you will get a continuous murmur with systolic component uh, is there. Diastolic component is the prominent one. And sometimes you can make the diastolic component louder by increasing either the pressure by hand grip or valsalva. So this is an important thing to remember about auscultation. Next slide. And based on the uh, people have described the murmur of RSOV and Hope and all, all the other people have described. I won't go into great detail uh, for this slide. Next one. But the site of the rupture is again important. As I told you, the RVOT, the RV cavity, the right atrium, and both right atrium and ventricle. See, for example, the RSV can just straddle across the tricuspid valve, rupturing either into the right atrium just before the tricuspid valve and just after the tricuspid valve. So that can occur very rarely. And then, of course, the left 
ventricle rerep. So the uh, in Southeast Asia, that is uh, most of the uh, observations are based in US as well as different, but most of them, 90% of the ruptured ASOP communicated with the right ventricle followed by the right atrium. And remember that most of the times when there's VST, I'll come to that, it is uh, usually supracrystal type in Southeast uh, Asians where it is associated with RSOV. So and then very rare sites are left atrium, pulmonary artery, and pericardium. Next slide. So this is the characteristic of the murmur. I'll show you in another uh, very good slide what are the things uh, which have done. So the rupture into the from the uh, right uh, ventricular, that is right ventricle, which is best heard along the mid to lower sternal border. And there will be a diastolic accentuation of the murmur because systole gets a little cut off by the active contractions of the RG. And similarly, you have a rupture going into the uh, right ventricular outflow tract. Next slide. I'll show this in a different slide. So a maneuver that makes the diastolic component louder if the murmur is not due to PDA. What is the maneuver? You can raise the systemic pressure by a post Valsalva effect or isometric hand grip which increases all the diastonic components of a continuous murmur, which is due to RSOV. So if you can't do that, you can just put uh, uh, two or three uh, BP apparatus and do what is known as arterial occlusion technique. Now arterial occlusion technique, we don't teach that much. Uh, it's a very good technique to bring out, to raise the systemic pressure and bring about the diastolic uh, component of the RSOV. So if the diastolic components decrease with these maneuvers, uh, then, probably we'll have to think of a, a coronary artery uh, to right heart fistula with the collateral passing. So the site of RSOV rupture and continuous murmur, again, I'm stressing it is loudest at the third left intercostal space. If it is into the RV, it is loudest at the lower left sternal border, if it is RA. And an important thing is, an important point is that if you turn the patient to the right lateral decubitus position, this is one of the maneuvers very few maneuvers are there when you turn the patient to the right lateral decubitus position and get an accentuated uh, conditions. So one is the LV to RA shunt, the other one is this RSOV rupturing into RA. You turn the patient to the right lateral decubitus position and you will get the murmur which is completely directed to the right side of the chest. So this is another maneuver which you can do. Next slide. Next one, please. Yeah, this is a, a picture I have taken from that uh, same book, but this is for coronary cameral fistula, but I have modified it and made it to uh, RSOV. So because the sites are almost the same, that if it ruptures, for example, A and B, if you take, if it ruptures into the RA, then this is where you'll get the maximum, that is the second right intercostal space and the right lower sternal border, turn the patient to the right side and you will see B gets augmented. So this is uh, for RSOV into RA. If uh, it is rupturing into the RV inflow tract, remember sub palpation, sub auscultation is one of the most important in uh, cardiology. It should never be forgotten when you present the case because the sub region gives the RV inflow. Everything happens in the RV inflow will be represented in the sub area like TR, or TS or whatever it is. Similarly, in the RV inflow when it ruptures, you will see the sub auscultation will give you, that is G and little bit of E will give you the best uh, uh, site for uh, rupture into the RV inflow. Similarly, you have the rupture into the RV OT, which resembles like ductus, and that will be the second left intercostal space, but best heard, next best heard is the third left intercostal space. For ductus, it is second left intercostal space, next best third in the infraclavicular region. And of course, if you hear it in the apex, it is very rare to get it into the LV. So this sort of a diagram, uh, even if it's a theory question, you can draw this. Uh, though it is given in the books for coronary cameral fistula, but uh, we can use it for RSOV. It's a slight modification, which I've done here in this slide. Next slide. Next one, please. 
So these are the same thing which I have repeated that uh, uh, just go to the previous side that uh, you have the uh, few things which are possible uh, to the, uh, have you gone one slide uh, afterwards? Okay, doesn't matter. So when you come to the, un uh, yes, these are the auscultatory findings according to the site of rupture I've already said. Elevated RV systolic pressures due to pulmonary atrial hypertension and narrowing of the tract due to contraction of the ventricle during systole. There is a venturi effect here also between the LV to aortic forward flow beyond the origin. And all this will tell you that this is only systolic component uh, is cut off or it is slightly less and the diastolic component becomes uh, um, better heard when it ruptures into the RV. And remember, RSOV can be associated with DSD and AR. So a lot of murmurs get submerged inside the continuous murmurs. Difficult to hear separately. And the presence of a VSD murmur will make the systolic component little prominent. And the RSOV murmur will become more intense in the presence of a VSD. And remember, dynamic precordium and congestive heart failure is associated with RSOV. Next slide. So unruptured uh, uh, aneurysm of sinus of Elselva will produce a to and fro murmur, and it will be slightly different from a ruptured, but uh, the thing is that uh, it comes to clinical exam as well as if the patient comes to you only when there is a, a rupture. But you can get a murmur of ESD, you can get a murmur of the RVOT, and you can get a pan-systolic murmur, and you can get an AR murmur separately just with an unruptured uh, Sinus of Pensilva. Next slide. And this is the uh, tabular column, again, I've taken from the same book, which tells you, uh, which summarizes RSOV to RA and RSOV to RV according to the site of the murmur, the intensity of the continuous murmur, the thrill, the JVP, and the S3 and RV and LV, uh, whether it is LV or LVS3 and MDM and of course, hepatic pulsations. Now, it is mentioned that there is prominent uh, A wave when it ruptures into RA. It may be there, but uh, usually when there is an extra filling coming into the RA from outside, the V wave becomes prominent. So important thing is that A wave becomes prominent if there is a pH, but V wave and C V wave can occur due to TR. And as I already told you, A, C, and V, all three can become prominent. Next slide. So these are the associated conditions, TR, MR, and VSD. And you have uh, uh, a PS type of murmur, or sometimes you may have a aortic uh, rapid ejection uh, murmur, but all these are buried inside the continuous murmur. And sometimes when there is unruptured, it may produce a, a gradient between the RVOT and the pulmonary artery. One of the questions asked, in cardiac cath is that if there is a gradient between RVOT and pulmonary artery, the diagnosis is more in favor of RSOV than PDA because PDA will not cause this gradient between RVOT and uh, uh, PA. It is the RSOV which will cause this gradient simply because the aneurysm will project into it. Next slide. ECG, of course, uh, is sinus. And you can get a prolongation of the PR interval. You can get a bottle branch block, you can get bifascicular block or complete heart block, etc. Next slide. And this is the ECG, just to show you the ECG of a, with a rather aneurysm rather than with a total rupture. Next slide. And of course, chest X-ray is important because occasionally uh, it shows an increased cardiothoracic ratio can have a left ventricular apex and some degree of pulmonary venous hypertension. But if the receiving chamber is on the right side, the pulmonary blood flow is increased with engorgement of the pulmonary trunk. And sometimes you can see calcification. Next slide. The important thing to remember in RSOV is that the aortic, uh, uh, the ascending aorta is not prominent. There's pulmonary venous hypertension. The ascending aorta doesn't become prominent. And of course, you get a, uh, as opposed to AR, where you'll get a prominent of the ascending aorta. Next slide. Pulmonary artery here is prominent. You have pulmonary venous hypertension. Next slide. These are the X-rays which are giving you the uh, of RSOV. Now, echo, of course, I won't go into great detail, except that the echocardiography will show the typical 
appearance, which you have to see, and that is called as the windsock extensions of the sinus. And the parasternal short axis is the most important thing. So you see the parasternal long axis and go to the short axis, which will tell you where it is rupturing. And you have to spend some time in the short axis view to clearly see where it is rupturing. Sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, if you put the color, it can, becomes completely confused. If you do transesophageal echo and put color there, it gets confused. So before that, try to look at with ordinary 2D echo where you are getting the wind soft. Next slide. Next one, please. So the, you use the Doppler and you can use, uh, try to get whether there are some intrinsic features like VSD or AR. Again, it's very, very difficult to diagnose, but other things like uh, uh, bicuspid aortic valve or RVOT obstruction or aortic coarctation can be made out. Next slide. And these are all the slides here. They are all given in standard books, nothing in that, but look at the windsock. And that is an important thing to remember in, they will always ask, where is the windsock uh, for uh, rupture? And that is, a, uh, if you see the left-hand side, you will see that the windsock is just abutting into the tricuspid uh, valve. Next slide. And these are all colors. Uh, I won't go into details. Clearer pictures of the windsock and extension. You get like that, there's no issue in diagnosing uh, RSOV. Next slide. Next slide, please. Can we go to next slide or? Yeah. Well, anyway, these are just uh, usual echoes. Next slide. More important is the associated VSD. And the most prevalent structural anomaly is the VSD, which is often associated with an aneurysm of the coronary sinus. And this has got a right coronary sinus, has a direct relation to the interventricular septum. And most of them may be supracrystal VSDs. Uh, Next slide. Next slide, please. The problem is diagnosis of AR, and this is uh, difficult at all stages. One, at the level of the echo, a good echocardiographer will be able to make out, of course, but at uh, angiography is totally, I mean, we won't be knowing where it is prolapsing, whether AR is occurring or not. And uh, so the important thing is, but you'll have to see AR is there or not, because the prolapse of the cusp with the associated VSD, that will be totally different picture then uh, RSOV, and many times the surgeon may tell you it didn't look like RSOV at all, it looked like a, a VST AR. So that is a very close and important morphology which you'll have to make out by cope before uh, subjecting the patient to uh, surgery. Next slide. Because there you have to have an EVR rather than to do a repair. And of course, this uh, IVS dissection and conduction abnormalities are shown. Uh, it comes as a quiz in many quizzes you will show an IVS dissection which is occurring and a pseudo aneurysm can form and it can cause a complete heart block. Next slide. So the echocardiography is, has some limitations, but although it is accurate for localizing the sinus, the site of rupture, the associated effects to some extent, the drawback is that small VSTs will be mixed, missed and the Doppler signal of the VST may be missed in the presence of the continuous signal from the RVOT. So to some extent, TEE may help in this diagnosis. Next slide. CT, of course, is important because it gives you more clearer picture, especially in the setting of uh, ASOV or aneurysm of the sinus of Anselba. Next slide. And of course, it can differentiate between aortic dissection and aortocal. Cardiac catheterization is not usually done except for the intervention and closing the uh, RSOV, or sometimes it is done to see some gradient across the 
right ventricular outflow tract, but still you can miss the VST on angiography. And uh, so mostly it is used for percutaneous device closure. Next slide. As a differential diagnosis, if they ask the conditions, these are the usual differential diagnosis, PDA, closest, AP window. AP window as a continuous murmur is quite rare. It's not that uh, common. Truncus, of course, there may be cyanosis, but in presence of large uh, pulmonary arteries, we may not get. Closest is VSD with AR, and the aortic or LV tunnel is only in small children or in pediatric age group. Usually, it doesn't come in adult. Next slide. And the management, of course, is important that uh, you do a surgical or a percutaneous. They won't deal too much into management. But clear-cut indications will be infective endocarditis or arrhythmias or coronary artery compression or outflow tract obstruction. Next slide. That is for ASOBs, largely. But rupture, you'll have to do the optimum manage. And then device closure, I won't go into the details. I'll skip this slide of device closure, except that always try to see in LAO cranial and in the RAO. So WPU, you have to take. Next slide. For the closure. Right? Many centers have large uh, experience of closure. Next slide. This is the closure shown by ECHO. So to conclude, ASOVs are uncommon, but RSOV is the clinical spectrum. An important thing is that you must be able to make out the continuous murmur, differentiate it from that of PDA, and see what are the different types of continuous murmur, and then where it is rupturing. All these things have to be kept in mind. Next slide. And uh, some of the older examiners, like me, they are fond of asking what is a classical art, uh, reference for uh, RSOV. Yeah? This, uh, because the newer people wouldn't have gone through this. This is the first uh, description of Sakaki Bara and Kono in American Heart Journal of 1962, which is there. In the GB Panth, uh, I think second floor, there is a li library, no? Second floor. So. We used to go there and see whether this American Heart Journal is there. If it is not there, it will definitely be there in the Bamsi Library. Bamsi Library is uh, new, but it is uh, it was there when I was in Bamsi. It was in the pathology block, of where the Delhi Medical Council is now. That is the Bamsi Library. So in your uh, hospitals, uh, no need to go there now. With internet, perhaps you can have a totally. I tried accessing it. It is not coming fully, the American Heart Journal. Maybe there is some other method. but. Whatever it is, only for you know classical purposes, just to read classics. And of course, uh, Perfuls has a lot of uh, uh, what you call experience in the Amplatz duct occluder. So these are some of the references. The important thing why I put is the Sakaki Bara's name, which they will always ask. OK, thank you. With this, I think I finished in time, and I'm ready for questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, very comprehensive, uh, clinical, and very uh, focused lecture. It was very, very nice presentation, as always, sir. And uh, the forum is open for discussion and uh, comments, uh, Dr. Simone, Dr. Sapal, Dr. Girish, if you have any comments, sir. And uh, I agree, sir, that uh, Sakakibara and Kuno have also given a classification of the uh, ruptured sinus of pulse yeah, yeah. in different categories. So uh, quite a few examiners are fond of asking that classification also, uh, just yeah, for, you know. It's the same, almost the same classification. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, not different, but... Uh, the original article is always worth reading. <laughs> worth reading. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, and three, and A and B and C, yeah. they have classified. Uh, just so to... it is repeatedly asked, at least in the classes in GV Punch, we were asked. <laughs> but we used to go to the library. I don't know where the library is now. The Some, second floor. Uh, <laughs> fourth floor, sir. Now. Yeah. Library is in fourth floor now, sir. Fourth floor now. Sir. Okay. And, and the Mamsi library has a uh, separate That's a separate library now. I've seen it. Yeah. Now it's a, <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, Dr. Subodh. Olden times. Yes. Yeah, yes, one of the ch challenge when there is a uh, continuous murmur is to assess the second uh, sound, you know, uh, whether it's pH or not, you know, that is always an issue. So any uh, tips and tricks to... Uh... Yeah, actually, the continuous, uh, that's a very important question, actually, I should have stressed on this. The second heart sound should be identified because it is usually buried inside the continuous murmur. So 
So how do you identify the second heart sound, whether it is uh, uh, accentuated or not accentuated? So you have to use the inching technique and go down to the apex. Remember, pulmonary atrial hypertension or the hypertensive uh, S2 or P2 will be heard at the apex. And it, if it is heard at the apex, the second heart sound, it will be clear from the area of the murmur. And then you can really make out whether it is a second heart sound which is accentuated or not. The only other condition where second heart sound is heard well, but there is no pulmonary atrial hypertension is ASD. ASD. You will get a murmur, you will get a second heart sound in the apex, but there will be no PA. So this is one of the mechanisms that we can use <laughs> uh, methods by inching technique and find out. The other method is to compare it with the right side. If you can get clear of the murmur, the right side, you will not be able to hear the towards the end of the murmur, uh, the loud second heart sound. So if the second heart sound is not loud, then the right and left both will be same. If it is uh, slightly different, then you know that the pH is, uh, there is an accentuation of the second heart sound. And that's an important point because the second heart sound most important in congenital heart disease, you have to know whether it is uh, split, whether it is uh, accentuated pulmonary component, uh, or occasionally in PDA, is it paradoxically split. And PDA also same problem because it will be buried inside the, to know the paradoxical split, you'll have to go towards the apex and come back and see. Even uh, because it's murmur is continuous, even systole de uh, depreciation also sometimes can become uh, a little uh, challenging. So better to palpate the apex or carotid or which is the preferred uh, way to... If the apex is palpable, apex is better. Otherwise, you'll have to uh, do the carotid. Yes, you are very right. That sometimes, you know, it, uh, especially RA rupture, you can't make out which is systole and which is diastole. <laughs> that could, uh, confusion is there. But of course, if it is continuous... And there is a uh, augmentation. The augmentation is always diastolic augmentation, mostly. Systolic uh, accentuation is little rarer. Sir, since uh, there is uh, uh, increased flow across tricuspid valve in uh, mm -hmm. rupture to RA, can we have a long diastolic murmur, like uh, the one murmur because of the rupture as well as the flow murmur across the tricuspid valve? So you can get a flow murmur across tricuspid valve in two situations when there is a rupture. One, when there is a large rupture, as you said, and there is a huge flow across the tricuspid valve, you can get a mid-diastolic murmur, but it's completely buried inside the continuous murmur. So That's to make it out separately, you'll have to go to the sub xiphoid area. And especially when you see a very tall V wave on the JVP with an increased Y descent, and you're suspecting TR also, in addition, you can go down to the sub cephoid area. Again, try to get clear of the murmur and see whether you can see the mid-diastolic murmur as well as the systolic murmur of the tricuspid regurgitation. In addition to that, the pulsations of the liver uh, will tell you that you are dealing with TR uh, and, of course, the flow murmur across the tricuspid valve. But the problem is that sometimes when it ruptures, it is, it is you know, almost into the RV. The difference yes. that it is overloading the RA and then coming as a flow murmur into the RV is a little rarer. Straight, it is very close to the tricuspid and all of you can see uh, when you're doing echo that it just abuts the tricuspid valve. Sir, in, I have two questions. One is presence of additional sounds, mm -hmm. like S3 and S4, and mm -hmm. uh, why there is no development of Eisenmenger. This is one of the questions usually asked in uh, the exams. Because okay. since it's a left to right shunt, but even then there is no Eisenmangerization. So, what, the first question is that S3 and S4. Now you have RV S3 and you can get occasionally uh, an S4 also, but because VSD is commonly associated with this, you don't get an S4 most of the times. But if the septum is intact, you may be able to hear it again at the area which is away from the murmur. And you can get an S3. S3 is very common. If you auscultate again in the sub xiphoid or the apex, you can get an S3 because that everything comes back to the left side and you'll get a flow murmur. Now, why you don't get a, a pulmonary atrial hypertension? Only because it's not long enough, the duration. There is definitely pulmonary atrial hypertension development because of the large left to right shunt. But actually, it takes a very long time and a very chronic state of uh, RV, uh, Valsalva, to develop an isomagrization that is rare. And secondly, that, of course, the 
the it is limited by many things like rv contractions the amount of pulmonary blood flow is restricted by many factors in rsob only when there is a, a ra rupture unsupported you do develop pulmonary atrial hypertension otherwise pulmonary atrial hypertension itself is not very common unless the history is very chronic to develop pulmonary atrial hypertension you must have a large uh, left to right shunt you must have pulmonary hypoxia you must have a desaturation so all these fact and increased pulmonary venous Absolutely. pressure so all these things pulmonary venous pressure can be increased but uh, hypoxia is lacking so you don't get a uh, arteriopathy uh, especially in those cases in which there is uh, diastolic augmentation uh, how to differentiate from uh, a coronary femoral fistula to right atrium uh, again to differentiate from, yeah. again very important uh, point that uh, the one is of course the site of the murmur the site of the murmur in coronary is will be what i have shown it will be almost same between rsov and that but uh, systolic murmurs are little rarer in coronary femoral fistula but the murmur has largely a diastolic component whereas systole and diastole both are present in uh, uh, that is also a continuous murmur i am not saying that there is no systolic component but it is rarer to get a strong diastolic component uh, alone in uh, number one number two is that coronary femoral fistulas more and more are totally asymptomatic history is not sudden it can be sudden of course but uh, it is quite rare to get sudden history like and then you don't develop congestive heart failure pulmonary atrial hypertension volume overload status more important is the hyperdynamicity of the precordium the precordium hyperdynamicity is an important indication and feeling the rv in the subsifoid is an important uh, clinical sign to say that you are dealing with the rso uh thank you so much sir uh, thank you for a very exciting and wonderful lecture and giving all the clarifications many of the residents are asking that you know uh, the presentation yes i will share and uh, this particular lecture uh, will be available after two days on the youtube also all these slides and presentations would be available and you can listen to it and uh, click all these uh, pictures for your uh, further reference and you can uh, uh, benefit um, uh, from this and uh, sir thank you so much on behalf of uh, delhi csi for joining us and again on um, i take your promise from you that we'll be disturbing you again in near future for more and more such sessions and it was uh, really nice to listen to you I again also... i will repeat the same that familiarity breeds contempt so you <laughs> give it a little gap <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's always a, a pleasure sir and joy listening to you and i also thank my colleagues uh, dr sumu dr safal and dr grish for uh, joining today and in task for providing us this uh, wonderful academic uh, platform Where we can connect with uh, hundreds and hundreds of residents. More than two hundred and fifty residents are online today. So, if you have any questions and clarifications, again I reiterate, please uh, write to us. And in case you want any particular topic to be uh, taken from any particular professor or anything, please uh, you know uh, write to us. We'll be very happy to request them to take sessions for you. And uh, keep on increasing your academic uh, appetite, satisfying your academic appetite. We'll be coming. next week with another session on thursday same time at 6 pm and uh, till then have a good time and stay safe vaccine is here i hope uh, it's going to create wonders for all of us uh, thank you so much for joining thank, thank you everybody thank you so much well, the, happy pongal sir before leaving uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you today yes. is a very auspicious day as yeah, yeah, yeah. we all know yeah. that the yeah, different yeah. parts of india yeah. we celebrate with a different name yeah yes but uh, a very happy and healthy pongal and uh, oh, and uh, uh, looking forward to you uh, looking forward to have a uh, another fruitful interaction with you again sir thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you, thank you. Thank you so much